actually, that was great. <clears throat> but now our next speaker, you may not know his name, he is Donor Fallon, but you will certainly know his website, Come Here To Me. And it's a fantastic compendium of all kinds of things relating to Dublin, uh, big and small, and very interesting. And um, you, if you don't know the website, you may have been given his book for Christmas as I was. Uh, it's called Come Here To Me, and his other book is about uh, Admiral Lord Nelson and the pillar. So he's going to come up and talk to us now. Donald Fallon. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. We are gathered here today to remember uh, Horatio Nelson. It's funny because, you know, against the backdrop of the centenary of the Easter Rising, uh, I suppose the 50th anniversary of the, the bombing of Nelson's Pillar might have gone largely unnoticed. And the irony of that is when you ask people about the Golden Jubilee of the Rising, 1966, what they remember, the moment they remember is this, you know, the, the 8th of March, 1966, and, and walking into the city to see what was left of it. Or in some cases, walking into the city to see what they could take and sell on. Uh, I've met a few people who tell me those stories. You can probably tell by looking at me, I was never up Nelson's Pillar. Uh, I don't even remember the time before the spire, dreamt up in 2003. But I've been looking at Nelson now for a couple of years, kind of backwards and forwards and from every angle. And I've met all kinds of people. I, I, I've met the archaeologist Frank Miles, who was involved in digging the site before the Spire of Light. Uh, I've met people who may have played a role in the demise of Horatio Nelson. Uh, and I've met people who are very fond of Nelson's pillar and often went up to the top of it. Uh, I, in my book I have a, a series of wonderful photographs, uh, very much indebted to Paul O'Dear, who had the good sense to go into the city the day after the blast. He took some wonderful photographs. This is one of my favourites. So I thought it was a good place to start. Uh, the monument to Horatio Nelson that was there from 1809 until 1966, I think it surprised many people with just how long it managed to stay there. Because in the decades that followed Irish independence, imperial monuments were exploding across the city with great frequency. Uh, so much so that the London Times once referred to Dublin as the city of exploding statues. <laughs> the British had a great fondness for equestrian statues and the Irish a great fondness for blowing them up. That was King William of Orange. Uh, he stood outside uh, the old Irish Parliament at Trinity College on College Green. A very impressive statue it was there from 1701, only 11 years after the Battle of the Boyne. King William of Orange, King George II, Lord Gough, all destroyed uh, in the years that followed Irish independence. In fact, it was happening so frequently, and people wondered when Nelson's turn would come, that one great ballot, Gough's immortal statue, included a worried Nelson pondering his own fate. He said, when Nelson heard about it, he wandered to Parnell. How, he, he shouted at Parnell, how long will I be left here? Now, Charlie, can you tell? For I don't feel safe upon my seat. I may retreat down to the street, like Gough's immortal statue up near the magazine. <laughs> Nelson didn't die for Ireland, but funnily enough, you know, with this being the centenary of the Easter Rising, it's worth pointing out he might have saved a few lives for Ireland. Uh, in 1916, the large imposing Dora column in the middle of O'Connell Street was used by volunteers you know, as they made their way from the general post office to occupied buildings on the other side of the street. Sean McEntee, who was there in the GPO garrison, he remembered watching two young rebels kind of run across the gauntlet of, of Sackville Street and he said, On the brave fellas came, their heads bent down, sprinting along a zigzag course to mar the enemy's aim. Into the cover of Nelson's pillar they ran and out of it again on the second half of their journey. So while Horatio Nelson didn't die for Ireland, he might have saved a few other people from dying for Ireland. Uh, Irish Republicans in the 18th century didn't look to Nelson, of course. They looked to Napoleon instead. So it's not surprising there was a hostility towards the pillar from the very day it went up. Uh, the Irish Monthly, a nationalist newspaper, they joked the day after Nelson's statue went up that we never remember an exhibition that has excited less notice or was marked with more indifference on the part of the Irish public or at least the part that pay the taxes and enjoy none of the plunder. But to Unionists, it was a very important symbol in the city, and there were often commemorative gatherings around it. I think that's a, that's a great illustration uh, from the time of a royal wedding, and look at the general post office uh, illuminated. You know, you had Trafalgar Day, marking the victories of Horatio Nelson over the French and Spanish fleet, and these monuments, these imperial monuments, were very important in terms of commemoration. The statue of King William of Orange that we were just looking at, for example, twice a year Unionists in Dublin paraded around it on the glorious 12th and on King William's birthday. 
Uh, in much the same way, Nelson's Pillar was an important centerpiece for commemoration for some in the city. Nelson withstood quite a lot. Uh, in fact, he managed to withstand the 1916 Easter Rising. Quite funny, isn't it, that Francis Johnson, uh, the man who gave us Nelson's Pillar, also gave us the general post office. And little could he know when he gave us the GPO, albeit accidentally, he was giving us what would become one of the symbols of Irish nationalism. So the same architect responsible for the GPO and Nelson's Pillar, worth pointing out. Francis Johnson was a Dublin-based architect. Uh, it's worth reminding people that Ian Ritchie, who gave us the Spire of Light, was based in London. So perhaps the monument that was blown up was in some ways more Irish, you could say. Nelson withstood the rebellion of 1916. One of James Connolly's daughters, in her witness statement to the Bureau of Military History, talks about walking down Sackville Street after the Rising, and she says, Everything I knew on the street was gone, except one thing. With great dismay, she recorded the fact Nelson was still there. Uh, some newspapers reported after the rebellion that the rebels had attempted to blow up Nelson's pillar. But people that were there in 1916, Liam Tannum and other volunteers, they say getting rid of Nelson was really the last thing on our minds during the Eastern Rising. But he came through it. I think the reason Nelson survived, and I think the reason Wellington is still there in the Phoenix Park, was the sheer scale of the monument. You know, blowing up equestrian statues was one thing, blowing up an incredibly sturdy monument like Nelson's Pillar was another entirely. But there had been attempts on it before. In the 1930s, IRA man Padre O'Flaherty uh, had toyed with the idea of utilising gelaginite to collapse the pillar. Uh, Nelson withstood all planned attacks. It looked like it wasn't going to be a bomb that brought him down, but rather bureaucracy. Dublin Corporation made it very clear on several occasions that they were willing to give it away. Uh, Holt Urban District Council in 1925 wrote to Dublin Corporation and asked if they could take it apart, dismantle it, and re erect it on the Hill of Holt. <laughs> <laughs> so Nelson, in the years after independence, was in a kind of strange position. And this was a great cartoon from Dublin Opinion, who often poked fun uh, at the Admiral, showing Nelson trying to get down off the pillar. <laughs> So, Holt Urban District Council are willing to put it up on the hill of Holt. Uh, other people wrote to Dublin Corporation with all kinds of ideas, saying, why don't we leave the pillar, but put someone else up there instead. The man shown here talking to Martin Luther King uh, is Mike Quill, or Red Mike Quill, as he was known. Uh, from County Kerry, he fought on the losing side of the Civil War, and he emigrated to the United States uh, in the years that followed, as did many anti-treaty IRA men. He became the founding member of the Transport Workers Union in New York, and became one of the most hated men in that city. They know him as the man who shut down New York. He ran the New York Underground Union and they brought the city to a halt for over a week. Well, Mike Quill, or Red Mike Quill, wrote to the Irish government uh, in 1963 with a suggestion. And he proposed that Nelson be removed from the pillar and in his place, a monument of Patrick Pierce or Jim Larkin could take centre stage. If Patrick Pierce or Jim Larkin were too controversial, he proposed John F. Kennedy. Uh, wouldn't that have been quite remarkable? For many years, Dubliners referred to O'Connell Street as the Street of the Tree Adulterers. You had Daniel O'Connell on one end, uh, you had Charles Stuart Parnell on the other, and Horatio Nelson in the middle. Historical continuity could have been kept. Yeah. <laughs> and we followed Mike Quill's suggestion. One of the people he, he proposed, of course, was Jim Larkin. It's remarkable now that on the Golden Jubilee, uh, of the bombing of Nelson's Pillar, there is an Englishman standing in the centre of O'Connell Street. It's Jim Larkin. Uh, with his arms raised to the air. Attempts on Nelson's Pillar, uh, there were some remarkable ones. This was in the 1950s, in 1955, when a number of students, primarily from University College Dublin, <coughs> occupied the viewing platform uh, and hung a banner of Kevin Barry over it. There's a, a great account of this attempt on Nelson's Pillar. One newspaper said, a group of university students forced their way to the top of the pillar on O'Connell Street on Saturday afternoon, locked themselves in with a key they'd taken from the keeper, and hung out a huge banner of Kevin Barry. Thousands of afternoon shoppers watched the group cut a section of the safety cage at the top of the pillar and unfurl their banner. It took three hours to get them down. According to the Gardaí, they were from the National Students' Council and they brought flame guns with them in the belief they could take Nelson down in this way. Uh, despite the intention to do damage to the pillar and the fact they were up there for three hours, nobody was arrested for their involvement in this incident. The Gardaí compiled a detailed uh, report into this and they they were particularly worried about one of the men they arrested that day on top of Nelson's pillar. They wrote, 
Joseph Crystal could be regarded as the ringleader in this matter. He is an active member of the IRA, as is Brendan Doyle, and it's likely that the other students are either members of the IRA or certainly active sympathisers. Crystal has been very, very enthusiastic uh, that the IRA organisation organization not be seen to be publicly responsible for this attempt, that he may be censored by IRA headquarters for taking part in it. The Garda who compiled that report also felt it worth noting that Crystal seemed to have it out for Nelson Spinner. And then the bombing came in 1966, uh, and there's such a strong folklore and mythology, I think, that's grown up around the bombing of Nelson's Pillar. Uh, it misattributes the blame, and it also pokes fun at the expense of the Irish Army, claiming that the controlled demolition that happened a week later uh, did more damage to the streetscape than the bomb of the 8th of March. We should never let facts interfere with good stories, <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you, that isn't quite true. Uh, this is one of the pictures that was taken by Paul O'Dear uh, in the aftermath of the bombing. I think they're fantastic images. They're great social history, just in terms of the fashion, you know, what people are wearing, but also the businesses around the street. So many of them, you know, call themselves after the pillar, the pillar cinema, for example. This image is particularly good, I think. Uh, these are the souvenir hunters. You can see they're smashing up a piece uh, of the pillar to make it easier to take home. Every mantelpiece in Dublin has a claimed piece of Nelson's Pillar upon it today. In reality, the bombing of Nelson's Pillar wasn't carried out by the IRA. It was carried out by a network of young Republican activists that was built around a very charismatic Joseph Crystal, uh, described by one historian of the 1960s Republican movement as a maverick. <laughs> Crystal lived a very colourful life in many fields. He was a keen cyclist and he was a central force behind the Ross, a racing fixture for many years that he once dedicated to the memory of James Connolly and Vladimir Lenin. Uh, many of those who followed Joseph Crystal from the IRA were veterans of the border campaign of the 1950s. And one such activist was Liam Sutcliffe, who told the story of planting the explosive device that brought down Nelson for the first time in 2000. Uh, Sutcliffe is blessed with a keen sense of humour. When he was picked up in 2000 after telling the story, he told the media at the time that arresting me in 2000 for blowing up Nelson's Pillar is like arresting someone in 1956 for occupying the GPO. <laughs> he remembered that the operation was codenamed Operation Humpty Dumpty and that the <laughs> first device planted in the pillar had actually failed to explode, leading to him carefully removing it before returning on the night of the 7th of March. Uh, Liam is not a man to watch his own work unfold. He went home. He was asleep at the time the bomb went off, and he heard about it the next day from the national media. Another great image from Paul, cleaner streets please. <coughs> After the bomb, Nelson was back in the headlines. Uh, in a way he hadn't been since he died at the Battle of Trafalgar. You know, for weeks everyone was talking about Nelson's pillar, uh, and the poor man's trauma wasn't over just yet. Nelson's head was stolen from a corporation lockup by students from the National College of Art and Design who proceeded to lease it out to anyone that was willing to pay for it. It ended up in some remarkable places, uh, including the window of an antique shop in London. If you get a good close look at Nelson's head, you can see chips in it from the 1916 Easter Rising. Uh, a young volunteer called Arthur Weeks from Norwich in England, who had no Irish blood whatsoever, but who supported the rebels. Apparently, he spent much of Easter Monday firing at Horatio Nelson from the GPO before he was told this was a waste of ammunition. But Nelson's head went on quite a remarkable journey, and the students from NCAD, one of whom later became an actor uh, in the Reardon's TV programme, proceeded to lease it out to anyone who was willing to pay. Bits of the pillar are everywhere today. You know, you'll find them in the Little Museum of Dublin. You'll find Nelson's head upstairs. His wandering days are over. Uh, this is Butler House in Kilkenny, where they've used you can see the word Trafalgar uh, as steps in the gardens of Butler House. When I was writing the book, I wanted to take a more kind of social history approach to look at ordinary people uh, and their memories of the pillar. I gathered some great pictures of corporation workers who were, of course, moving large chunks of what was left of Nelson's pillar. I think this is a particularly great picture. Uh, Paddy Nugent standing on the remains of the base uh, of Nelson's pillar. But all of these little things are very, very important, I think. You could go on and on about the afterlife of Nelson's Pillar. It's almost as interesting as the life of the monument itself. All kinds of replacements were proposed, some of them totally mad. Uh, this is Jan Goulet, uh, the Breton nationalist and an architect. Jan Goulet proposed this tribute, if you could call it that, to Patrick Pierce uh, for the centre of the street, including £150,000 worth of brass. Frank Sherwin, the councillor, when he saw this, he said, 
If that is ever built, I will see to it, it's thrown into the River Liffey. <laughs> Another suggestion across the way was the Millennium Arch uh, in 1988, the year of Dublin's so-called Millennium. The Pillar Project was launched, and the idea Dubliners really got behind was this, the Millennium Arch, not unlike the Arc de Triomphe uh, in Paris, but the afterlife of Nelson's Pillar in many ways almost as interesting as the life of the doomed monument <coughs> itself. I think it's remarkable when we bring transition year students into this place and we talk to them about 1916, we start off in the room just inside in the exhibition and we ask them, what's that in the centre of the room? And they don't know. Uh, but hopefully this year, hopefully with the golden jubilee of Nelson's Pillar, uh, it'll be back in the public consciousness and maybe, just maybe, we'll finally get rid of the spire. So thank you very much. <laughs> And um, it's quite interesting that this part of the afterlife of the pillar includes ballads and songs about him. And one of the ballads is going to be sung now by Luke Cheevers, and it's called Admiral Nelson, and this is a song he wrote himself. Eighteen hundred and sixty-six on March the eighth day. Now that's the this is a song to the um, the Green Arm Whale Fisheries. So the date and all sort of matched the, uh, the song by the Clancy's. And uh, I was picking up old cigarette boxes and writing out with a pencil. And this was the following day. And the day after that again, I, I finished it. And I, uh, <coughs> this is the result of it. In 1966, on March the seventh day, a thunderous roar came from the city's core, and old Nelson was no more brave boys, and old Nelson was no more. Now he looked so grand on his lofty stand, he stone sword be his side. He's one eye fixed, made of granite bricks. <laughs> down on the liffy side, brave boys. Down on the liffy side. For, for all a hundred years, Elder Ratio stood. Never once a glance to the ground To see Irishmen die And dare to defy His mighty England and the crown brave boys His mighty England and the crown Now many citizens tried On occasional times to remove this famous guy. But he just stood there with his stone eyes stare, and he watched their coffins go by, brave <laughs> boys. He watched their coffins go by. But when the yoke was broke and John Bull caught a tide, he never reckoned with the day. He'd lose his other eye, his other arm and his toy, and a lot more to besides brave boys, and a lot more to besides. But his fateful day came in March 66, in the wee hours of the morn, when a thunderous roar came from the city's core and old Nelson was no more brave boys and old Nelson was no more Now, Alistair is going to read a poem by Louis McNeese. 
a strangely prophetic poem called Dublin. As Mary suggests, this poem <coughs> looks back to a time before the uh, events of, of 66. Grey brick upon brick, declamatory bronze on sombre pedestals, O'Connell, Grattan, Moore, and the brewery tubs and the swans on the balustraded stream, and the bare bones of a fanlight over a hungry door, and the air soft. <laughs> I meant that to happen. <laughs> and the air soft on the cheek, and porter running from the taps with a head of yellow cream, and Nelson on his pillar watching his world collapse. <laughs> So, all good things come to an end, and we're now going to give Nelson the last word in Nelson's Farewell to be sung by Tony. That uh, first verse of the poem, uh, when the Dubliners sang this song, which they didn't write, a fella called Joe told them, you know, that's not, that's not the, the monumental hip to Joe Dolan from the regard, this is a fella from Galway. Uh, this fellow from Galway who wrote the song. Uh, but when the Dubliners recorded, they had that as, as an introduction to the song. It was terrific. It was prophetic in its own way. So most people know this song and you know the chorus, so don't leave me alone with Pearson. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Alan and Nelson, he's no longer in the air. Oh, turn a little, a March in Dublin City Fair. Oh, to -ra 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 From his stands of stone and mortar, he came clashing through the quarter where once he stood so stiff and proud and ruined. So let's sing in celebration, it's a service to the nation. And farewell, Admiral Nelson, to A fifty pounds of jelly night, he sped it on his way. Oh, to the and the lads that made the charge, we're in debt to them today. Oh, to in Trafalgar Square it might be fair to leave El Nelson standing there, but no one tells the Irish what to view. So now the Dublin Corporation, they can stop the liberation when the boys of Ireland show them what to do. For 157 years he stood up there in state. And to mark El Nelson's victory all the French and Spanish fleets. Oh, to -ra 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 in the morning, without a bit of a warning, El Nelson took that powder and he blew. So and now the Irish nation have Parnell at a higher station <laughs> than poor old Admiral Nelson to the loom. the Russians and the Yanks and with the lunar probe they play. Oh, to the loom, 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 And I hear the French are trying hard to make up lost headway. Oh, to the loom, 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 Ah, but now the Irish joined the race. We have an astronaut up in space. <laughs> Ireland boys is now a word of power too. So let's sing in celebration. 
It's a credit to the nation and farewell I'm from Nelson to Radio. Oh Rome, Britannia, oh marmalade and jam. Six Chinese crackers of your ears gone by.